You're listening to the Tel Aviv Review here on TLV1. I'm Gilan Halpern. Welcome back. I am now joined on the line by uh, Roberta Rosenthal Quall, a legal scholar and the founding director of the DePaul University College of Law. She is the author of the new book, uh, The Myth of the Cultural Jew, Culture and Law in Jewish Tradition. It was recently published by Oxford University Press and she's now joining us. Hello, uh, Bobby. Welcome to the Tel Aviv Review. Well, thank you so much, and thank you for having me and giving me an opportunity to, to speak with you about my new book. It's a pleasure. So uh, uh, let, let me start with a slightly provocative question. There are so many people, non-practicing Jews out there, who define themselves as cultural Jews, that is, people who distinguish between belonging to a religion and belonging to a culture. Why is the cultural Jew a myth, then? Well, I'm, I'm laughing. I'm really laughing because um, over the Chag, over Shavuot, uh, one of my um, fellow uh, congregants at, at synagogue came up to me and said, did you see the, the new review of your book and commentary, uh, which just apparently came out? I hadn't even seen it. And, and one of the points that um, the reviewer makes was, um, A, she, makes, she does a great job of showing the intersection between law and culture, but, but B, the idea that that cultural Jews are somehow motivated by by Jewish law in, in their culture, you know, he, he he wasn't as convinced about that. So your starting point is sort of the same question mm. um, that you're asking me, and I, and I think and so I've been thinking a lot about this, you know, since the wee hours of the morning when I actually you know read his review. So I, I think for me, um, I, I think one thing that is not generally understood about um, Jewish law in uh, broader terms, um, and this is true among scholars, um, secular scholars, even some Jewish law scholars would reject the premise, and certainly by the lay population. And this book is directed to both scholars mm-hmm. and lay audience. Um, is that, first of all, the idea that law is not this objectified system that, that simply has dropped, and in the case of Jewish law, that has you know, dropped down from the heavens. That is not how law generally works, and that is not how halakha works. And that notion in and of itself is not intuitively apparent to many, many Jews. Certainly, there are Jews on the right end of the spectrum. Uh, by the right, I mean the religiously right end of the spectrum that would completely reject the idea that, that culture has any influence in the formation, not the application, but mm-hmm. the formation of Jewish law. But on the more progressive end of the spectrum, the idea that Jewish law, you know, which is probably seen by many, um, I, I don't want to use the word secular Jews, because I think that has a different context in Israel and even in the States, mm. but by Jews who would not consider themselves religious. Right. Okay, so the idea... Non, non-practicing, I mean, it's the most straightforward... Jews, well, or even yeah. Jews that are practicing, but, but not according to Orthodox... Uh, mm-hmm. Not according to an Orthodox practice. Okay. What, what so about the, Jews I, who don't believe in God? Or Jews that don't believe in God, of course. Oh, they fall under I that mean, category for you. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. And by the way, by the way, you know, you know, there there can be Jews that don't believe in God that are very, very religious and observant. You know, they like the way of life. I mean, certainly that's a phenomenon that we see here in the states. And my guess is, you know, it, 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 that, that that may be also something that, um, that that you can find in Israel as well when push mm. comes to shove. Exactly. Because as you know. <laughs> We're a religion of practice, you know. I mean, it's the practice, it's what you're doing that is largely furnishing the mark. Yeah. So, 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 how does it feed into culture? That's the if it's practice on the on the one hand, which is very important in in Judaism, and you know the slightly more amorphous, uh, you know, perhaps uh, uh, realm of culture and ideas. They are at the end of the day very closely linked. Exactly. And that's the premise of my book. And so in and of itself, the idea, again, that Jewish law 
has been shaped by human hands over the millennia, that, number one, is, would be a revelation to, to many people, because most people are not thinking about Jewish law in those terms to the extent they think about it at all. Okay, so that's the first thing. But on the other side to that, because of that reality, because you cannot separate the law and the culture, they are really so intertwined. Even those Jews that do not think of themselves as being religious um, in a way that... It, you know, orthoprax would suggest religiosity. You know, there's a basis in halakha and in the Masora, the tradition, for what these Jews are doing, even if they don't realize that basis because they're not necessarily knowledgeable, you know, about Jewish law, but it still has shaped their practices. Can, can you so give an example? These, perhaps, I, I don't yes. know, I'm thinking about the, the perhaps the most heretical uh, Jews out there, I don't know, perhaps those who led the uh, the communist, the Bolshevik party in in Russia, or those who 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 disavowed any kind of Jewish religiosity. What were the elements in their worldview as Jews that you think were fed by halacha? Okay, well, I can't. I mean, first of all, and I do want to make a, an important um, distinction here, especially a distinction that's relevant in the U.S. Um, and, you know, when I'm talking about a cultural Jew, I am talking about a Jew that is still identified as a Jew. Mm-hmm. Whether the parties you mentioned would still identify themselves as Jews um, in the way that I'm speaking of, I can't really say. For so, sure, so, so you know? what, is, what is exactly the way you're speaking of? Because if we, it's someone who just says, is it a voluntary thing? I'm part of the of the Jewish. Uh, collective? Uh, how, how, do you, how do you draw the line? Yeah, I mean, there are, well, first of all, this is a very gray area. <laughs> That's one of the points in my yeah. book. It's not black and white. <laughs> it's gray. So you can't really draw lines. But somebody who, you know, if, you know, again, in the United States, there's been much discussion about the, the Pew Report, which was the most comprehensive study of the American Jewish community. It came out in 2013 while I was writing this book. And yeah. so what I would say to answer your question is I would include the people who would say that they are either to use Pew's terms, Jewish by religion, clearly, you know, that, that's, that's the case, you know, even if they're not Orthodox, but they're Jewish by religion. They can you say, what is your religion? They will say, I'm Jewish. Okay. Or those Jews who would not say that they are viewing Judaism as a religion, but they consider themselves, you know, Jewish. Okay. And that was the second category. Yeah, the Jews of Jews. no religion, as, the, as they the were Jews known in the, yes, the, in the Pew Report. Yes, the, Jew, the Jews of no religion, exactly. Mm-hmm. And so my points are really relevant to that group of people. If, if someone is completely unidentified, you know, disaffiliated, and I'm not talking about denominationally affiliated, but just not opting into Jewish peoplehood at any level, that's not, I'm not talking about that group of people, because yeah. that's beyond the pale of the group I'm talking about. I'm talking about the many, many, many Jews um, here in the, in the States, um, and, and again, there's, a, there's an analog in Israel, but as we'll hopefully discuss, Israel is a different situation yeah. for many reasons. But there's, there's many, many groups of Jews in the United States who say, yeah, I consider myself a cultural Jew, all right? And what they don't realize is they have been shaped. Okay, so what, is, what, what are the elements in the halakha that shape them as cultural Jews, even though they are non-practicing and even uh, um, Jews of no religion? Okay, so I'll give a couple of examples. Um, some ritualistically oriented and some non-ritualistically or some behaviorally oriented beyond mm-hmm. the ritual. Okay, on the ritual side, you know, many Jews will, will have a Passover Seder. Many, many Jews will have a Passover Seder. They may not go through the, the Haggadah in, in its entirety, you know, but they, they certainly mark off time to spend on the first night of Pesach together with their family. They cook special foods. They prepare. The same is true with Hanukkah. Okay, um, many Jews, according to Pew, even if they're not religious, surprisingly, they fast for all or part of Yom Kippur. They oh. may not be doing this to, to observe halakha. They may not even be thinking that there is a legal basis for what they're doing. It's not in their minds. And that's the point, you know, that's one of the points of my book, that because the law and the, what has become Jewish culture is so intertwined with mm-hmm. one another, people are actually... Um, 
observing the tradition or parts or pieces pieces of the tradition, even though they don't recognize it. So that's on a ritualistic end, I would say. You know, another thing I would say to add to the ritualistic part is um, – here in the States, the celebration of B'nai Mitzvah is very, very common, and people may not go to Shul regularly, but oftentimes, if they're in a Jewish community, they're going to find themselves in Shul at some point during the year to celebrate um, a Bat or a Bar Mitzvah of a neighbor, a friend, a colleague, mm. etc. So those are some examples. But beyond that, um, more behavioral uh, examples, you know, the idea of, of Sadaqah. Yes, many, many people do good deeds, give charity, etc. But I think the art of sadaka is one that is very much um, culturally prominent, you know, among Jews. You know, you have the whole, here in the States, the, the, the federation system. There are a lot of quote-unquote cultural Jews that are affiliated with the Federation, and they're not religious, but they really staunchly support what the Federations do. Yeah. Um, and that idea of sadaqah comes directly from the Torah leaving the edges of the field um, untouched for the poor, for the widows, etc. People don't necessarily know the link between that. Um, but I think, again, that's why I, I hope that my book is somewhat um, provocative to them, because it's like a light bulb will go off, and they'll say, oh, I get that. Okay, mm-hmm. that's a really interesting connection. I never thought about that. Um, similarly, you know, as a lawyer myself, I've often wondered, why is it that there is so there are so many Jewish lawyers? I mean, if you think about it, there are some professions that are highly represented by our, by our people, and yeah. law is certainly one of them. Again, if you go back to the dialectic in, in, uh, of Jewish history over time, so much of which has been influenced by Talmudic discourse and what goes on on the pages of the Talmud, it's not surprising that Jews would gravitate in their cultural DNA toward a legal type of, of framework. So those are the, the, the more amorphous examples of the more amorphous connection but, but, between would you say, Jewish culture. Would you say, Bobby, that this is a particularly... Jewish phenomenon, or is it just predominantly Jewish? Um, that what is a particularly Jewish phenomenon? The, the, the link between uh, the, the religious uh, elements and the cultural realm. Well, but wouldn't, wouldn't Christians be fed mm-hmm. by a similar, perhaps a, a, a kind of unperceived uh, connection to their religious roots. Uh, I, I don't know, for example, just like you said, that uh, uh, Jews of non religion celebrate uh, uh, the Passover Seder. I mean, there are some non practicing Christians who celebrate uh, Christmas and perhaps exactly. go to church from, from time to time. How is it different to uh, the, the phenomenon that you're describing uh, uh, that relates to Judaism? That's an excellent question, and it's actually something I've been thinking about a lot lately, the, the notion of cultural Christianity, right? Mm-hmm. And, and I think there is something to the question of cultural Christianity. But first of all, Christianity, is, as you know, it's, it's broad. I mean, Christianity can include, you know, fundamentalist um, Protestant Christians as well as uh, Catholics who have a, a, a more a system, a legal system that is somewhat, not completely, but somewhat more similar to Jewish law, mm. and that there's that you know tradition of canon law. I think the difference is you're quite right. There are many, and I know many, many Christians who who you know even the term Christian suggests that you have some sort of affirmation of faith um, in, in Jesus Christ, and if you don't have that affirmation of faith, you're not you're technically not considered Christian because you don't have the affirmation. Yeah. But they're culturally Christian; they celebrate, or, or even just people who were born into a Christian household without ever practicing the religion. I mean, you yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly, exactly. That's exactly right. And there, it's true there are certain traditions. And Christmas being perhaps the biggest one, the Easter egg hunt being another one that's that's considered. They're more family-like traditions. In that regard, okay, in that regard, you can say there is a general similarity. But I think what goes on with Judaism and Jewish law is very, very different. And why? Because Jewish law, halakha, is an organic legal system that covers virtually every aspect Aspect mm. of human behavior. It touches on all forms of life. And because of that, and because there's been this human component to the development of Jewish law, 
it has influenced our people, you know, for millennia in terms of how they think and how they practice. And, and that's, it's intangible, you know, it's, 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 it's not black and white. Again, you can't put your finger on it, but I think it makes it very, very different from yeah. from Christianity. Uh, now, now I'd like to take you perhaps uh, to a different place and ask you a methodological question. The practice of cultural analysis is a somewhat common scholarly tool in the field of, of legal studies. Can, can you tell us a bit about it in, in broad terms and perhaps come back to, to this uh, particular study about how it, it is applied uh, in the case of uh, Jewish law? Yes, certainly. Um, well, cultural analysis is a, um, a method of looking at law that, that has become particularly popular, um, I would say, in the last third um, of the 20th century. Um, again, there, there, there'd been a notion that law, any law, is a subjectified system, one plus one equals two, and that, you know, it, it developed in sort of in a vacuum from any cultural influence. I would say toward the end of the 20th century, particularly with the emergence of a, a few legal phenomenon, um, number one, um, the narrative movement in law, where, where law is looking, seen by in legal terms, circles, not just as the rules, but about the stories of the people behind the rules. Okay, that's number one. Number two, the emergence um, of uh, types of scholarship in law um, that are being done really by what we call outside scholars, uh, and this typically includes women, um, racial minorities, um, you know, gay, gay legal theory, um, mm. and many of these outside scholars actually rely on narrative as well. Um, but a lot of this was basically um, surfacing, I would say, in the last third of the 20th century, so that law is seen not as a cut-and-dried system, but as a product of culture. And so there were people that were actually looking at secular law in that way. Yeah. Now, from my perspective, um, you know, I have always looked at Jewish law or halakha as a, a, a reflection of, of, of the culture. In other words, you know, I grew up um, in what, what you call in Israel the Masorti movement. Okay, here mm -hmm. in the States it's the conservative movement. Um, I've always looked at Jewish law sort of as in positive historical terms, namely that it's kind of, you know, I do believe, just for the record, I do believe in the divinity of the law, and I do believe in the divine origins of the law, but I believe, personally, I've always believed God has painted in a broad brush, and that it's up to humans and human beings to fill in the blanks of more details. And by the way... As indeed kind of they have done for the past 2,000 years or so. Exactly, exactly. And by the way, you know, Menachem alone in his, in his four-volume treatise on Jewish law essentially said, you know, that the Torah is here on earth, it's not in heaven, right? Yeah. So that's, it's not, what I'm saying is really not, it really is very consistent with how Jewish law has always un been understood to operate. The problem, of course, you know, from a sociological standpoint is the more interpretation, the more you allow for human involvement, the more it's seen as a less objectified system, the more you have the potential for that slippery slope that concept that we talk about in law that can be the, the undoing of the system. And I'm very cognizant of that. Mm. So, but, so that's how I've always viewed Jewish law in my head. I realized maybe about eight years ago that there was nothing being written about halakha that specifically applies the cultural analysis methodology to halakha. Part of the reason for that is that most of the people in the legal academy um, that are doing Jewish law work are really looking at Jewish law more from uh, a yeshiva-based perspective, and they're focused on questions like, you know, what is the Jewish law on, you know, copyright, or what is the Jewish law on marriage, or, you know, they're looking at those kinds of questions where you can actually participate in the give and take of Tom discourse yeah. applying it to a and, and you've taken a, a bird's eye view of the of the whole of the whole thing I'm basically looking at it on a macro level, exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and so I'm looking at it as a legal system. And as a result of that, you know, I, it's very clear to me that applying the insights of cultural analysis, and again, cultural analysis, you talk about 
absence of black and white. Cultural analysis is very murky. It's very messy. It's very gray. When I first started this project, I had to slog through many, many books and articles on cultural analysis just to get a handle on what that exactly meant and how you could apply it. Okay. So there are certain key elements, I would say, that, that, are very, that are found in the writings of those who look at law in a culturally nuanced way, mm. which is the way that I look at law yeah. and generally and halakha specifically. So what are some of those ways? Well, again, given the cultural analysis is consistent with the views of outside scholars, as we just discussed, one of those ways is that law is or develops uh, in response to the views of those in power. In other words, you know, those who are making the law, those who are in the power, uh, that have the seat of power, are going to have their views more, shall we say, prominently represented in the discourse than those who are not. Um, so that's one, certainly one factor mm -hmm. of cultural analysis. A second factor um, has to do with the law being contextual. Law develops in particular cultural environments. Um, that's why the laws look different in, in, different, in different areas. Yeah. Um, and so that's another factor, or that's another application of cultural analysis. And with that, it, it's also contextual, and it's historical. Again, the environment also is represented just not geographically, but also chronologically, you know, at different periods of history. Yeah. Um, I'll have to cut you uh, off here and perhaps move to the to the last question because we're quickly yeah. running out of time, I'm afraid. Sure. Uh, we, we did talk about uh, the, the American context of your work, but one of the chapters in the book is about Israel, which, as you said in the beginning of our conversation, is a very dissimilar, very different uh, case. Can you describe how your analysis plays out in the Israeli context? Um, yes. Israel is, is, I'll tell you briefly why it's different, and then briefly why I think Israel can also be viewed as sort of a model for what I'm talking about okay. in the States. So why is Israel different? Israel is different, obviously, because the majority of Jews in Israel, even if they're secular and not religious, are still living in Jewish time in a majority, in a culture in which they are the majority. And you can't underestimate the significance of that distinction. Mm -hmm. um, so that's number one. Number two, um, Israelis speak Hebrew. And so they have an access to the sources um, the Jewish sources, um, in, a, in a way that, that the vast majority of American Jews... Well, in theory. Not. In, well, if they want, if they choose to yeah. pursue the sources, mm -hmm. they can understand, right? They can yeah. understand, although biblical Hebrew, obviously, is somewhat different from conversational. It's still... Yeah, and, 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 and at least from, from the, you know, my impression is that very few do, but that's a different question. Right, but they would have the access to yeah. if, they, mm -hmm. if they do, if they do. And, and again, you know, being living in the majority culture, you, you also are not facing the same types of threats um, to the dismantlement of peoplehood that we have in the States. And here I'm talking about, uh, I'm talking about intermarriage specifically. Uh -huh. it's, it's different. You know, the, the realities are different. Absolutely. Having said that, though, um, it is my understanding that there's a lot of spiritual searching going on in Israel, even among secular Israelis. And there have been a lot of, um, especially, is that, would you agree with that? There's a lot of recent phenomenon in Israel that represent this, this spiritual searching. Um, yeah. Secular Israelis are learning more, even traditional with traditional sources. There's things such as the, the Kabbalah Shabbat in Jerusalem, and, um, and uh, there's a... Uh, a, a, a movement in Tel Aviv that that um, is basically um, focused on um, you know sort of celebrations of yeah Israeli it's called culture. Jewish renewal here Jewish renewal exactly yeah. mm -hmm. and there's a there's a interest in Jewish renewal and it's all, there's also a, um, a, the idea that's propagated you know in some ways by Jewish elite uh, in in Israel that Israel is sort of like the microcosm the laboratory for Jewish peoplehood and Jewish life and Jewish civilization you know even if you're not adhering to a strict adherence to halakha and that's been promoted by institutes such as the Hartman Institute yeah um, and and others who, who believe in that type of pluralism uh, religious pluralism so I think part of that is can be used as a model for the states. 
Okay, but in the states, we have to work a lot harder because we're dealing with a probably deeper degree of ignorance, um, and clearly we've got the assimilation issue, um, and we have the intermarriage issue. And so part of the point of what I'm trying to say here is, you know, especially to the religious community, I'm trying to say, look, don't underestimate the power of cultural identity. Don't write off those Jews because, frankly, they're important to the mission and the survival. And to the liberal end, I'm trying to say it's great that you feel culturally identified. It's great that you do a Pesach Seder or whatever else you're doing, but you have to understand that there's more to it than that, even in terms of what you're doing, because that is based on this wonderfully rich tradition that you you have to be part of as yeah. well, and you have to know, uh, you have to have the knowledge to be part of it. So I'm really got a message for both sides of the table. Uh, a very convincing one, and I have to say that on this optimistic note, I'm really happy to wrap up uh, Professor Roberta rosenthal Quall, uh, the founding director of the DePaul University College of Law and author of uh, The Myth of the Cultural Jew, Culture and Law in Jewish Tradition. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me today. Goodbye.